All right. Um, my name is Heather Wickens, and on behalf of the National Heritage Area Best Practices Call Planning Team, I would like to welcome you to our September National Heritage Area Best Practices Call. Uh, we have taken a break over the summer, so this is the first one in several months. Um, and we're going to be talking about membership programs in national heritage areas. Um, a quick reminder, we are recording these. They are available on YouTube, and I will send the reminder link out. Um, so that you can go back and look at past broadcasts, or if you have to jump off before we're done today, um, you are able to go back and watch it later. So just a plug for um, our, our growing list of recordings of National Heritage Area Best Practice Calls. Um, so today's theme is membership programs. We're going to be hearing from two National Heritage Areas, Motor Cities National Heritage Area and Schuylkill River National Heritage Area. Um, and to start off, we're going to hear from Motor Cities and um, Sean Pomaville and Tiffany Pierce will be sharing and then we are going to move to Schuylkill and Elaine Schaefer and Tim Finchel will be sharing from there. So without any further ado, um, Sean and Tiffany, take it away. Hello, everybody. It's so <laughs> great to see your smiling faces and wave at some of you too. Um, I missed you all, it's great to, to be on this call. So I'm gonna to present today, with, I'm the Executive Director of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area and presenting with me today is Tiffany Pierce, who's our Administrator and our Events Coordinator. So she's on the call today too. And we're gonna to talk to you about membership. So membership for the Motor Cities National Heritage Area is a given. Um, it is a, um, it's in our bylaws. We talk about our, our membership, our members in our bylaws. We talk about them as dues paying memberships, members, members in our bylaws. So it's really our bread and butter. That first screen, if we can go to it is why there's bread and butter on here, because I look at it as the bread and butter of our fundraising, um, stool, three-legged stool, and membership is one of those legs. It's a very important leg. It's also a very humble leg. So that's how we look at membership. It's humble because it doesn't bring us a lot of money. However, it is critical because as uh, everybody knows, we can't use federal funds to do some of the most important things we have to do, which is fundraise and uh, lobby. So this is the income from which we do that. This is part of the donations that come in to the heritage area and not all of it is paid for from this. However, it's the bread and butter. It's the basic day-to-day -day stuff that we need to do to continue to operate. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tiffany who's gonna talk to you a little bit about this overview screen you're seeing here. Hi guys, I'm Tiffany Pierce from Motor Cities National Heritage Area. I'm the Office Administrator and Events Coordinator. So I'm going to step in just a little bit to give you a briefing of what we do. So for instance, we have a website that will always host our membership yearly. We update it yearly to make sure that anything that changes, if it's our benefits or our letter, anything that's contingent upon our members, you know, reaching out to our website, you can always check on this portion and you'll see the new portions. So for instance, we have a space also where we submit at the end of the year, we do a membership drive and we always reach out to 6,200 members that we have in constant contact and in the email and the actual auto newsletter that we do weekly, you'll always see that promotion where we're kind of gearing them up. Hey guys, membership's coming up. Just giving you a heads up if you're interested. And then they will actually know what's coming up. Another thing that we do is promote social media. We offer um, an early birth special to anybody that's interested in purchasing a membership outside of the norm. And if they do it within this time frame, you can actually get some kind of incentive. This year, we're gonna actually do Lions tickets, which is a big deal, because obviously we're winners, right? <laughs> 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 and, you know, typically that really gets everything going. So I appreciate that portion. Outside of that, when we reach out and we recognize, so if we have typically 
300 members and we only have 179, I'll say, okay, Sean, I think we should reach out and do a, a lapsed membership, right? You know what? I recognize that the 120, whatever, didn't get that, that extra push. So we'll set out another membership at the spring portion of the year. And we'll say, hey guys, I recognize that you were a member at some point. We don't know why you didn't come back, but if you're interested, you can still come out and reach out to us and become a member again. So that's kind of how we fulfill our membership within each year span. Um, the next slide is our social media campaign. So we have a communications manager that actually drafts up a way to reach out to them. If it's social media, if it's our e-newsletter, or if it's any other level of communication, he'll actually draft it out for that whole membership drive. That way it keeps everybody on point and you know what the next steps are. So nobody's overlapping each other and everybody's consistent in understanding what the next steps are. So this, uh, this screen is what the actual letter that goes in the mail looks like. So this is last year's letter that we sent out the end of November. Um, and, you know, it's just uh, pretty cut and dried. It's got a little bit of a, a picture of our map. That's where we are in Michigan. Uh, the other picture is a ribbon cutting ceremony for a park we opened up that year. Signature of our chairman and myself. And at the PS down there, you can see... Um, that it, we're pitching to people who are who are 70 years old and older if they have to do a minimum required dis, distribution from some sort of um, an account, an IRA account. So we wanna be sure and hit that when we can because some people are looking for a way to do that. And that's the front page. It's got our board and, and leadership council, you know, in the bar on the left. The back talks about, um, discounts and offers at our partner organizations. Um, we are always trying to bring our partners in. We have a passport book that we get stamped. And so we're trying to get more and more people into those venues. And at the bottom, you see what a membership card looks like. And so uh, that year, it's you can see under the blue there, the second bullet point, Motor City is trivia cards. You know how you send out a little premium tchotchke for membership? We were trying to save money during COVID, so we did just a real basic um, uh, card stock, you know, that had perforations with factoids on the front and answers on the back, so people could play auto heritage trivia. And believe it or not, it was super popular. We were uh, uh, pleasantly surprised on the feedback we got there. This is an overview of the members that we've reached out to. So since Sean and I have actually come on board with Motor City's National Heritage Area, this is actually something that her and I actually took an initiative and actually put real effort towards. And this is actually pretty impressive. So what we do is after you become a member, we actually make sure that you're notified and we also place you on our website. And this is what you would see every year as we get new members. So the list is actually growing. We're doing really well. And we're pretty impressed because this was something that her and I worked on together. Um, this is also the organizational members. So we also list our individuals, but we also make sure we take out um, time to make sure the organizations are also listed. So you can take a look and see, you know, that's pretty good. <laughs> So just briefly, we do have a, a split in the individuals and the organizational members, as Tiffany mentioned. So that's for a few reasons. Um, it's far less expensive to join as an individual. And then mm -hmm. where organizational memberships are concerned, we are not focusing on for-profit uh, organizations. These are nonprofit organizations and public bodies. So these are other museums and archives, uh, whatever nonprofit it might be, counties, etc. So that uh, we can have those organizations represented because they're part of the heritage area. And so you can see a significant difference in the number, I mean, in the levels of funding that comes in. Individuals, you know, we have it for a discount to begin with if you're a student or a senior, then an individual family supporter. Organizational members are based on revenue. So if you have a budget of a certain amount, you pay 50 if you're a very small nonprofit on up until you get to a $1,000 turbocharger level for our bigger nonprofits. 
uh, such as the Henry Ford or a Wayne County or an Oakland County. So that's the difference in those memberships. So here we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, um, we were asked to talk a little bit about challenges and pros and cons. Um, so for those of you who have done this, I know you've had these same thoughts. And, and if it's not apparent by now, we do this very grassroots. As Tiffany mentioned, when she came on board and I was there, we, we sort of birthed this a membership program and, and got it to the level that it is now. But we've done it all with spreadsheet. We haven't bought a program yet. It would be far more convenient to do that, but there are expenses in, uh, associated with it. And until we break out of our current level of number of members, which is around 200 to 20, we don't want to invest that kind of money into a, a program or a platform that can do a lot of this work for us. So it's basically, you know, grassroots. So we do a, a lot of work on cost savings. We've done both internal mailing and fulfillment versus outsourcing. And we've kind of landed now where Tiffany does all of the um, cleaning up of the mailing lists, uh, look, dedupes it for ourselves um, and you know, adds to it however we're able to add to it that year. We create the letter, we have somebody do layout and printing, and then we send it to a shop to mail out. It's a lot easier to do that and a lot quicker, more efficient. Um, and then always a, a challenge is how to expand this membership mailing base. So this is by far our biggest challenge. We've looked at purchasing mailing lists. Uh, we haven't done that yet either. We haven't taken that jump. You know, there's certain zip codes that have a lot more wealth in them than other zip codes within the National Heritage Area. But even that is a um, substantial investment. So we haven't done that either. So we do things like we reach out to our partners. Some of them will exchange their databases with us. Some won't, you know, pe people can want to be you know protective of those uh, we collect addresses every time we can as i'm sure you all do as well addresses and emailing e email addresses uh, in constant contact events registrations all the usual types of ways our newsletter our newsletter people have to opt into and it's an electronic newsletter so though that's where this 6600 database that tiffany mentioned at the beginning comes from Um, membership was one of our main sources. It's always been one of our um, sources of uh, funding when it comes to doing something outside of the federal portion, right? So because we have federal guidelines, certain things we're not allowed to do. So sponsorship and membership have always been heavily sourced towards the things that we need to do outside of, you know, the recommendations or the guidelines for our federal funding. During COVID, this was one of our remaining steady sources of our, ex excuse me, external income. So we assumed that because of COVID, people would not like mail in checks and we would get them to kind of graduate and kind of move towards, you know, our electronic services, but they didn't. So we still had a flux of checks from our actual, you know, audience. Our audience is older and we recognize that. We just assumed because of COVID, they might migrate into doing um, our online services and they didn't take into that. So it was one of the surprises. We just assumed that they would actually acclimate or change to that, and they didn't. So <laughs> we recognized that. Outside of that, we looked at um, our income. It didn't change. We actually had an influx last year compared to the year prior, right when COVID started. We thought that maybe what we were offering to our members, it would keep them in a particular area where they would say, okay, you know what, for this bank for my book, I can get this. It didn't change. If they support Motor Cities, they support Motor Cities. It had nothing to do with what we were offering them. And we were super appreciative and grateful for that. So you will see in this next slide that it shows you how we literally gradu you know, gradually went up. The only time it was uncomfortable was right when COVID right hit and nobody knew exactly what it was. But after that, we picked right back up where we left off the year prior in 2018. So...
And if you look, you see it starts from 2016 to 2017, 2018, 2019, they were kind of uncomfortable. We also thought that because they couldn't get that tax write off, that could have been a reason why people pulled back a little bit in 2019, but then right in 2020, we picked right back up, so. So, lessons learned. So we, we do want to make sure the membership is worthwhile and we also want to make sure our partners are involved. So like many of you, we're almost in competition with our partners for fundraising purposes. So people often ask, a funder might ask, well, why should I give to you when I can give directly to your partners? And so we, we try and bridge that gap wherever we can. Um, and this is one of the ways where we can partner with our partners in making money. So these are some of the sites that have given us, you know, reduced admission or discounts in their um, gift shops, et cetera. So we've tied this in with our passport. We uh, make this available to anybody who has a membership and, and nobody else gets these. And then our partners honor this when they show up and produce their membership card. So that's that's a listing of about 20 of them. Um, here's some of the past tchotchkes. So when we talk about tchotchkes, um, you know, the gifts, the giveaways, we're, we're, we've learned some lessons here. You know, one year we had flashlights, one year we had pens, and when you're fulfilling a membership, it's expensive to mail those things back to people. So we've learned kind of the hard way to how to roll back on that. Um, and uh, so this is basically what you got for your membership in past years. You know, there's a luggage tag in there. There's some uh, coasters. That right there, that black thing right in the middle is that goes on the back of your cell phone and you can put your driver's license and credit cards. It's super handy for getting on an airplane and keeping all your stuff in one spot. So this is what those look like. Tiff, Tiff why don't you talk about the card? So the membership card is actually a big deal. Uh, two slides prior, you were able to see what our partners offer. And so if you don't get your card, you can't get that discount. So that's a big deal. So that actually was one of the things that drove some of the people to our membership because they're really interested in the museums and actually participating in what we have to offer in our passport program. So this is what our membership looks like. And right in this area is where you would see your name or whatever organization that you have. And then you could use that and that's how you would get your discounts and or admission from our partners. So basically that's our whole presentation. Again, I just like to reiterate that it's our bread and butter, um, our daily uh, loaf of bread and butter. And we count on this modest amount of funding to help carry us through with some of the activities we've mentioned above. And there okay. you go, if you have questions. Sean, could we wait and do questions after um, Schuylkill has talked? Will that yeah, work? Yeah, of course. Okay. Of course. Um, that would just be easier. Okay, so Tiff, if you can take it down, please, and then we'll have Elaine and Tim do their presentation. And if anyone wants to add questions into the chat, sometimes questions and then I forget what I wanted to say by the end of the next presentation, put them in the chat and then we'll go through them together at, um, after this. Yes. yes. Okay, Elaine. All right, hello everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen up. Um, hello everyone, I'm Elaine. I'm the executive director of Schuylkill River Greenways in uh, Pennsylvania. We are five county heritage area outside of Philly. Um, and we're the watershed of the Schuylkill River, which is one of the main tributaries to the Delaware River. Um, and you should know about our, our organization um, before we start talking about membership that we, um, we have a lot of people participate with our programming that they don't even know it. <laughs> we do the, our big regional trail, it's called the Schuylkill River Trail, and it goes from Philadelphia all the way up into Schuylkill County. Um, and so we, you know, there are literally millions of people that use that trail and they have no idea who we are or, or you know, that, that we're building that trail for them and we're maintaining for them. So that has always, that's always in the back of our head in terms of membership of that, you know, all of those people should be our member. We should have a million members. <laughs> um, now, 
when I took, I took this position about four years ago. And when I took the position as executive director, one of the things my board asked me to do was get more members. We should have a million members. At that point, that was in like 2017, um, we had about the high 200s, maybe just around 300 members. Um, <clears throat> and so I did really focus that first year, the, the 2018 membership year on um, trying, to, trying to figure out how not only to get more members, but the members that we had to get them to give more. Uh, so um, that has been a focus of over the last four years. And I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the successes that we've had and um, you know, some of the, the things that weren't so successful. Um, first, I'm gonna show you um, Right now, our membership is, um, we do one letter, one big drive a year in November. Beginning of November, we try to get in before everybody else in the giving season. And, um, and now we'll do one follow-up mid-year for members who had paid before, but who did not you know, re-up. We assume they just forgot. So two times a year. When I took this position, they were doing five mailings a year to you know, this limited world. And it just, it was such a waste of time and energy and money and it wasn't yielding. In fact, when we went down to two, we, were, we started, we got more members. So that was one of the first things we did was like really make a concerted effort to get the right people on this list and to cut it down and stop badgering people about it. Um, and we do have, um, we do social media as well as we do as the, um, as the membership drive in the mail. Um, and when we do our November membership drive, it is just as much social media as it is um, the mail. And we end up getting a lot of PayPal. You know, there it's, I, I don't know the percentages, but we get probably the majority through PayPal at this point and not through um, the mail. Um, we also do um, Giving Tuesday, I think it is in November. The Tuesday, you know, which I have to tell you, we all hate. <laughs> Everyone hates it. We hate doing it. We hate being bombarded by others that are doing it. But every Tuesday, every giving Tuesday, we get at least two thousand dollars in our pay, you know, PayPal that day. So it's like it's hard not to do it because you know that's two thousand dollars you could have, but we hate it, um, and we'll continue to do it because you get two thousand um, dollars. So. In 2018, we really concentrated on this. We, we did something that um, uh, a consultant had told us to try, which was in the letter, remind them how much they gave last year and then ask them for you know, the next level up. So if they gave $50 last year, say, thank you so much, this has been so amazing. We're, we'd love for you to consider giving 75 this year. And it totally worked. That was the year that we got um, more, our per, our average uh, donation went up by like $50. I mean, it went up a lot. Um, so it's totally worth doing if you have the wherewithal to do it. Now, just like Motor Cities, we are still off um, Excel sheets and our membership is now almost 500. Um, and we are now shopping uh, databases because it's, it's, it's almost untenable. We have, now we have all of these different spreadsheets of different categories and it's crazy now. So this winter, we are gonna migrate over to a data system that will help us deal with all of this. Um, anyway, so after 2018, when we initiated that, unfortunately we did not do it in 2019, 2020 and 21 um, you know the the identifying how much and then asking for more because we lost our um, the membership person that was doing it and when the new person came in we kind of lost that capability but we are looking to do it again this year um, but our membership did go up steadily in 2018 and 2019 but I will say in 2020 and 2021, bonkers. I mean, we're now at 500. It, it almost doubled because of the trail. And well, I mean, our main programming is the Schuylkill River Trail and kayaking on the river. And in 2020, people discovered, oh, you can go outside and have an amazing time for free uh, on, on, the, on the trail. And they really did. And we took advantage of it. We put up and down the trail signs. Do you know who, you know, do you love this trail? 
it's a nonprofit that that is running it. Um, donate here with a big um, one of those those square things, the QR codes, and we and we got a lot of new members. Um, but the average donation went down. The average donation went down to about a hundred dollar average donation, whereas um, in 2018 when we took did that exercise, it was about one hundred and fifty dollars was the average donation. Um, all right, let me take you through when someone goes to sign up um, to become a member. This is the first page they see, but you'll see on the very top here, there, there's a donate button on top of every page you, you when you come to our website. So it's always there reminding you that we would like you to donate. Um, like um, Motor Cities, we have, you know, some, I think they're pretty modest levels. Last year we raised these. Um, I think it was like $15 for this and 25 for individual. So we, we kind of doubled them and nobody said a peep and it really did help our bottom line. Um, I think for, for last year, for um, we got a 475 members and we brought in $51,000. Um, so that little, you know, like $25 extra for each member made a big difference because um, you know, and for most people, what's the difference between 25 and 50? They're, they're going to they're gonna write the $50 check. Um, of course, still for students and, and um, seniors, it's still 25. And the benefits that they get for SRG, they get a 20% discount on swag, like t-shirts and hats and stuff. And the Schuylkill River Trail um, logo is, is kind of cool and popular here. So we do sell those things. Um, and they get 10% um, 10, 10 off of our programming. Now this is really meaningful for a big subset of our population because we do a Schuylkill River sojourn every year and we have 200 people participate. And it, if you do the whole week, it's like 800 or $900. So 10% off of that is a lot. It's more than the cost of a membership. So a lot of people become members to get the discount on our sojourn and that does drive up membership. Of course, in my view, those are people who are going to be your member anyway. They're not new members, you know, so it's not so much of a victory. <laughs> um, we do do during the holiday season, we put out on social media pretty hard, you know, bump people we, and we get a good response to this. Give, um, give somebody a, a gift of membership to our organization. And we do like little bundles, like a hat that they'll get delivered a hat and, you know, a, a cool cup plus a membership brochure and the whole thing. Um, we have a Heritage Legacy Society, which is you know um, planned giving, which we have probably I don't, only about five or six people signed up for. Um, and we'll see with that cut type of giving, you just never know. Um, and then here are some, um, you know, we have an endowment fund and a, um, Amazon Smile some other ways um, to give. Uh, I want to see the, the listing of the um, members that you showed on, that you put on your website. We include the listing of all members in our annual report, which we, we call it an annual report, but we really only do it twice a year, to, uh, every two years, um, just because it's a lot of work. We're a little staff and, you know, usually it's pretty good for about two years. Um, and I have to tell you, every time we do one, we forget somebody <laughs> and it's really hard to do it perfectly. Hence, we need a, some software. Um, so I, I really hate that page because it's very hard to get it perfect. Um, we also have done a couple of campaigns where we have tried to make it really personal. I mean, I'm sure you've all gone to those seminars where they tell you that you get better results if you, you would do your fundraising, please, by making it personal with a story. And we have done that on a number of occasions. Um, this was a particular gentleman who um, had a really um, poignant story about how he used the trail and it nursed him back to health. He almost died, the whole shebang. And it, it, what it did get, um, you know, we pushed it out on social media in, conjunction with a with a membership drive and or a giving drive and it, it did work. I mean people react to that type of stuff. This is our um, membership brochure that we you know give out at you know when we're tabling and we mail out on certain occasions. Um, it basically we it's it we try to keep it um, sort of descriptive in general of what we do uh, so that we can keep it without doing it every couple of years. Um, so I, we haven't redone really this in several years. Uh, let me see, what else did I wanna tell you? 
Um, we do, I will say uh, one of the more successful, um, oh, another thing they get with um, membership is we have every year an annual meeting at, in conjunction with an art show that we do every year and the art is based on our um, heritage area and the watershed and members get to come for free and it's a really nice evening with you know, great food, wine and, and people love coming to that. So that is another perk that people like to be members for. Um, one last thing I want to share uh, that we have had success with is um, we have, you know, pulled out of our membership list kind of the most generous donors and the ones that have given the most consistently. So maybe they only give $50 a year, but they've been giving $50 a year for 20 years. And that list is probably about 80 people. And those 80 people I divide up to give to my board. So each board member gets four or five names. And once or twice a year, they call or write to those people. And it's not asking for money. It's just, we so appreciate we're having an annual meeting come up. We'd love to have you come, come join us or, you know, it's, you know, whatever. And it's just outreach touch. You guys are the best. You're what keep us going. And that, that, those people that get that letter give consistently and increasing numbers every year. So um, it's worth, and, and if you can, you know, give your board members that task, they usually rise to the occasion and we'll do it. Um, and it makes them feel good because they're helping and, and of course the donors love it. Even if they don't get a hold of them and just leave a message, the donors get a message, wow, that was nice. You know, they like, they appreciate what I'm doing. I'm making a difference. Um, so I'll stop there. That's, that's um, sort of a, a very brief overview. We, we don't do the swag thing with our membership. One year we did, we gave out um, uh, car magnets and it, which was kind of fun because then we saw our car, our logo on people's cars all over the place, but it's very expensive and I don't think it had an impact on the giving that year. So we kind of, we cut it out and it's also a big pain in the neck. <laughs> Thanks Elaine. Um, if you could take the PowerPoint down. Sure. Okay. So now we're going to open it up to questions. There are some in the chat, but before I get to those questions, um, does anybody have a question that they would like to ask either um, Sean or Elaine? All right. If not, I'm going to start pulling questions from the chat because there's been quite a few. Okay. Um, all right, so Sean, this question is for Motor Cities. Um, for are your organizational partners providing the membership discounts? You're muted right now, Sean. Some of them, not all of them. Um, you know, we actually did outreach to that list that ended up on the back of the letter and asked what they were willing to give and donate. And so they came primarily from our passport book, which to qualify to get into that, you need to be um, a destination open a certain amount of regular hours. So that's, that's kind of the genesis of where that came from. I don't know who asked that question. Am I answering what you're driving at? Oh, no, I was Angie and I don't, She can always type yes. another follow-up question. Yes, thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. Thank okay, you. Angie. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Delane, this is for both you and Sean. Um, in addition to PayPal, do you use Venmo or Zelly or others? I don't think you can use Venmo for a business. We did, I mean, maybe they've changed their rules, but about a year ago, we tried to set up an account on Venmo and um, it, you're not allowed to use it in, as a business. Okay. You, it doesn't matter that you're a nonprofit. I don't know about Valley. We, we've never looked into that. And right. um, we use PayPal now. It's not been our primary one, but we, everything is done over Formstack for us. So we create the forms on Formstack and then we connect them to the bank accounts. Account, bank account. Okay. All right. All right. Next question. Um, all right. This is for both of both of you. So do organizations have to become members in order for you to include them on your passport map tour itineraries, etc. 
And I think Sean all responded to that. So Elaine, um, I guess that question's for you. Um, I don't really understand the question. I, we do have program, some programming that is members only, um, but it's actually since COVID we haven't offered it, but it was, we would once or twice a year do um, exclusive tours of partners that we would only invite 20 and you had to be a member to do it. Like, and they were, you know, we went to a recycling plant and went in and got the private tour of a recycling plant, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so that's not, you don't do organizational members. You have individual members who have like that. Right, no, our corporate support yeah. comes through sponsorships. Okay. I think that answers the question. Um, okay. All right. So here, this is a great question. Um, okay. So Sean and Tiffany, did you see your individual membership numbers grow from folks located outside of the national heritage area after your motor city cities at home programs and virtual events. So because of virtual events or, or programs like that, did you see a membership grow outside of your heritage area? We did. Um, I don't think it was significant. I'd have to double check. It was a few members, though, people that we normally wouldn't have gotten from California or from anywhere around the world. I think, you know, maybe I could count on two hands. So to go from zero to 10, yeah, I guess it would be significant. But um, in the grand scheme of things, it's been more of a... Um, We've seen those people come along from, you know, far away to watch the Motor Cities at Homes uh, um, pieces. Yeah, we didn't turn a whole lot of them into members. Elaine, do you do anything like that? Like virtual programs or anything that you've picked yeah, up? No, we did a lot. I mean, we did everything uh, for about six months. We did our annual, pro our annual report, our annual program. Um, and we also did a lot of educational programming. Um, and I have to say, I don't, I mean, when I would go through like list who was watching, it was pretty much people we, that who were in our orbit. You know, I don't feel like we really expanded our orbit through that programming. Okay. Um, all right. Katie wants to know if either of you guys sell magnets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the swag. If the bumper stickers were expensive and a pain to print, do you make them for sale? No, we did not reorder after we ran out of them. Um, but we did in our, just in our last um, staff meeting, to be honest, we were like, let's bring those back. They, they were cool. So we probably will. I don't know that we'll sell them, um, but we'll, we might use them as an incentive again. Yeah, we... Um... We don't sell sway. We don't have an online store. It hasn't proven to be much of a money raiser for us. It might be for some other NHAs, but it isn't much of a money raiser for us. I guess one more question on swag. Elaine, um, I know Schuylkill used to give sweatshirts or windbreakers or coats or things to like trail folks who earned them with miles on the trail. Do you still do that? Oh, yeah. Oh yes, there's a whole hierarchy of what you get for how many miles. We have a program called Trail Ambassadors. And we have 80 people participating and you have to log hours every month. You can't just volunteer when you want. You're like, you have to log a certain amount of hours every, because they, they patrol our trail for us. And um, as they gain their hours, we first, it starts out with a t-shirt and then they get a cool coat and then they get their own first aid kit. And that, you know, it goes up. And, so there's a bunch of swag that we spend on that. But that sounds to. fun. Yeah. Okay. All right. So our next question, and I'm not sure I understand it, but I'm going to read it. And then if we need clarification, we can ask, do your donor champions, people that you own campaign goals annually for you? Okay. Ravonda, can you revise your question? Because I'm not understanding the question. Sorry. Yeah, um, no problem. My question was, did, did former lives 
Okay, Ravonda, you're breaking up, so we can't actually hear the question. Campaigns have had champions. We one very wealthy donor, and then that way, you know, they started to try it again. Can you hear me? Well, it's a little better. Try. Can you try to ask him the question again? I'm sorry. I can. A champion is someone that kind of owns the campaign with So I think maybe I, one donor that really believes capable of supporting you. So I think I'm hearing something that I comprehend in there, Ravonda. And so I don't know if this answers your question or not, but I will say that in the past, we have used that champion model. Uh, we actually had a donor from um, a utility offer to match uh, donations up to a certain point in time. So I, I don't know if that's what you mean, but, um, you know, and it was successful. It was a good incentive and it got things going really well. Okay. Looks like you answered her question, Sean. All right. So, all right. This is apparently a question to everybody. Um, so, does anyone, so I guess this is a heritage area, all heritage areas on the call. So if you, if, if you do, let us know. You can type it in the chat or, or talk. Um, does anyone make a substantial profit from selling merchandise slash swag? We do. We, we have a, in particular one, we send, sell a lot of merchandise like t-shirts and stuff like that. But the thing we make a lot of money on is a, um, it's a water trail guide for the Schuylkill River for people who boat and kayak and fish. And it's like a one of a kind item and we make a lot of money on it. However, we make a lot of money on it that we put away in an account and we can't use because we use it all, we save it all towards when we have to update it and we publish it again. But we do make a lot of money on it. Oh, well, I think that's good. I mean, we, we have merchandise and I think I have like a couple sites that stock looking for Lincoln stuff. And like one of them particularly reorders quite regularly, but we do not in any stretch of the imagination make a significant profit on it at all. So, okay. Um, okay, we have more. Oh, Lowell says that they do. I oh, know everybody pay attention to the chat because some people are answering the question. Uh, hey, hey, Heather. Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. I, I, I'll just, you know, elaborate on what I put in there. We have historically done a lot with gift shop sales, branded merchandise, um, especially with the Yuma Territorial Prison, which is one of the most um, visited attractions in all of Arizona. But between gift sales and admissions, the prison has become self-sustaining every year in, in terms of the operations. We don't uh, need funding from the city or anyone else in order to, to operate it. Uh, we do still uh, seek funding to do what we need to do to, you know, to restore and preserve as necessary. We felt it's enough of a part of what we do that we just recently, over the past year, um, started up a new gift shop in the in the other state park that we manage, the Colorado River State Historic Park, that we call the Yuma Crossing Discovery Center, and it is uh, beginning to gain in popularity. And the goal is to be able to use those sales along with um, admissions there to make it more self-sustaining. But it's also just part of our overall branding issue uh, and and efforts to uh, bring more people under the tent. Uh, get them wearing uh, Yuma branded things. We try to make sure that, you know, even if it's particularly to the park, that Yuma, Arizona is on there for when visitors and I'll come in as well. So I think that, you know, um, strategically done, it can be very valuable and it should be part of, you know, just overall uh, marketing, awareness building and all. And, yeah, you don't have to go crazy with it with too much trinkets and trash and, and all, but we, come up with things that people use 
and um, it has um, it, it's been been beneficial. So we're cautiously optimistic, and you know we won't know as much about the new shop until we finally uh, get to some sense of normalcy with COVID and all. That's that's obviously had an impact, but um, you know I'd encourage people to to look at if it if it works for you. I mean it's not necessarily for everybody. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Lowell. Um, okay, we are down to like about 10 minutes before we have to sign off. Does anybody, I we think we've pretty much gone through the questions in the chat. Does anybody else have a question for Elaine or Sean related to their membership programs? I, I actually have a question for everybody. Like, does anybody have a successful approach to Giving Tuesday? No. Okay. Does everybody hate Giving Tuesday? <laughs> no, uh, Elaine, yes. Yes, I, the, uh, we, we have participated in Giving Tuesday the last two years. And uh, the first year, which was pre-COVID, we actually did okay. I mean, it wasn't a ton of money. It was only about, you know, 25, 30 grand that, that we raised that we wouldn't have. And uh, it was for uh, specific projects and all, but it brought some new um, investors under the tent that hadn't uh, been involved with uh, the Human Crossing National Heritage Area. So uh, we do it every year. We did it again this past year. And, yeah, we, we raised a little bit of money, but um, uh, it, it was off of the, the first year due to, uh, to COVID. So uh, the mayor um, uh, made a proclamation you know, naming Giving Tuesday as, as special for humans. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to build on it. I wish uh, uh, Sarah Halligan, our marketing and communications person, was on because I charged her and, and another one of our colleagues with, with running that. But, yes, it, you know, it, try it out. You know, it's not going to, you know, it's something that you have to build on, just like with anything else. Mackenzie, your hand is raised. <laughs> I have a question for Elaine and Sean um, or anyone else who wants to chime in. Um, as you staff for your membership program, is that the only job of that person to run your membership program? Or how many other jobs does that person have? What per or maybe the better question is, what percentage of time does your membership person do spending member doing membership? You can go first, Elaine. <laughs> I do not have, I don't have a development staff, period. There's no development staff. I'm, this is the development staff. So um, the membership drive is a joint effort between me, our, our office administrative manager. She does most of the, you know, the letters and the organizational and the pulling and the numbers and all that. And then also our finance director, is you know participates with obviously like getting everything in in our records so no it's a it, nobody has this job <laughs> we, we sort of all have this job exactly the same here too yeah so uh this is a joint team effort it uh we do count the hours i don't have that handy to give to you Mackenzie, off the top of my head either but you know it's um we do track it i can get that to you and um, it's Tiffany is, if you notice, has a multiple title title, you know, she's office administrator, events and management coordinator. I mean, you know, she does all of those office things. And so we do this, you know, we have a, like a, a work plan and it's really busy this time of year, starting about now, October, November. And then, um, you know, there's follow up in, in the spring about all the people who got a letter who didn't respond, we give them the second mailing. Um, and so it's kind of, as Tiff said, after this many years, it's sort of a second nature. You know, everybody's got it down pat and it goes pretty smoothly. Somebody else asked a question about how much it costs. I would say it's probably $4,000 in direct and indirect costs. So that includes staffing and that includes printing, mailing, that kind of stuff somewhere in that ballpark. I would, I'm curious who, who, 
who on the call also has a membership program and maybe just raise your hand or you know, do one of those reaction buttons so we can see if you're not on the camera. So I'm, I'm curious about how this is um, utilized by other national heritage areas, if it is utilized. Oh, Lowell raised his hand. Um, there are some, there are, there are several heritage areas. Um, some of them couldn't make today's meeting, hence why they're, they're not on here too, um, just because of, of other scheduling conflicts. I think um, Last Green Valley does, and I, they're gonna join us in December and talk about their formal and informal partners and in that talk about their memberships. Um, but they could join today and we, we scheduled them for December. Um, I think Annie's on the call. Annie, I think you tried a membership program but didn't think it was useful. Do you wanna share that experience or did I just annoy you? Sure, by so I don't know why my camera's not working, but can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you just fine. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, we do have a membership program. Um, and um, we aren't pushing it that much now, uh, partly because we, we didn't have a lot of live programming for the last two years, went virtual. We, um, we, it wasn't very successful getting people to pay for virtual programs. We've done better with our virtual programs, just asking for donations. And that's been more successful. Um, our membership program probably works best for people that want to access um, our island and our lighthouse, and particularly if they want to uh, spend an overnight out there, they have to be a member. So that's helped drive the membership program. Um, we just uh, frankly put less energy into it over the last few years, partly because of COVID, but even before that, we, uh, we have, I think, about 300, 350 members. Uh, we started trying to work on other ways to generate revenue from programs, and for sponsorships. We just thought those uh, would pay a little bit more, which they do. Okay, thanks Lowell, for sharing, you... Annie. Sure. Thank you, Annie. Lowell, did you want to share too? Yeah, you know, really, uh, Sean, talk to us in, in about, a, about six months to a year, but we just um, have instituted for the first time with our two state historic parks, um year membership um if you will for um, a family two adults up to four kids couple which uh you know in a, a re large retirement community is important and individual year passes to both of our state historic parks and uh this is something that the mayor of the city of yuma has wanted to do for a long time and so we, we just started that. And we also are taking more of a regional approach uh, with this and marketing to uh, the counties adjacent to Yuma County, even uh, on the other side of the border. Uh, we are a border town and over into uh, California um, to uh, try to get more people to come into the heritage area to learn more about us. and. Um, to join us, if you will, in the, in the mission. So we're excited about where it could potentially go. Um, we won't know more until after we see how the initial response is, but um, that's, um, that's, that's something that you know, I would consider you know, getting people to join and commit to, to more than just uh, an episodic visit to any of our facilities. Well, thank you for sharing, Lowell. Thank you to everybody who participated. Um, we are almost out of time. Is there any last question before I wrap this up? Okay. I'll ask one more question if no one else has a question. Okay. Um, Elaine, you mentioned how you have the QR codes on your trail that you are supporting the trail. I know several um, heritage areas here on the call have trails. Do they have QR codes for donations along their trails? as a way of engagement. Is that a question for Elaine or for everybody? Well, I just meant that she mentioned having the QR code on the trail as a way, you know, many heritage areas said they had more engagement of use of their resources um, that they maintain and build 
um, through 2020, 2021, and did others kind of take that increased usage as an opportunity for revenue generation? Elaine, you're the smartest one on the call. Yeah, well, honestly, to be honest, I don't really know how many because we that would just take you to our page and then they would do it through PayPal. So it'd be hard to know where they were when they did it. But we did have a big increase in smaller donations. So I got to think that some of it was that. And um, plus, it's just having people understand that the trail isn't just there. You know, somebody has to build it and maintain it. And like putting our name to that is just enormously helpful. It just puts in people's head, oh, wow, there's this entity. You know, I, I do love this trail. Yeah, I should pitch in. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank Sean and Elaine and Tiffany for, for sharing today. This has been a great call. I am going to do a promo real fast because we have a fall lineup. And this is the first time in the nearly 10 years we've been doing this, that we actually have a coordinated schedule of themed calls for a whole series. Um, so next time in October on the 28th, we're going to do a, a call on communities as partners in national heritage areas. Then we're going to do sites as partners in November on the 18th. And then December, we're going to do who are formal and informal partners right before we all have to do our, you know, and report to the National Park Service. So um, I would say like I put sent it out in the email, but we have the calls already scheduled. They're themed. If you can't make one, they are going to be recorded on our YouTube channel. Katie put that link in the chat. Thank you, Katie. Um, early at like the very beginning of the chat. So if you you've missed one or something, please um, stay tuned. I'd like to thank all of our presenters and everyone who who participated today, even not our former ones, but people who chimed in. So thank you all for coming. And we hope to see you next time.